This video will be spoiler free to all major plot points. Now I won't be discussing any of the conclusion or events leading up to said point. I personally believe that you should play Deadly Premonition regardless of watching this video. Now without further ado, please enjoy the video. Let me ask you, is there a game that pops into your head when I say this? Do you like a game that could objectively be called bad? And I'm sure something comes to mind, a game you absolutely love and praise, but if someone who wasn't clued in just happened to walk into the room, they'd probably be confused as to why you're playing whatever game that is. In comes Deadly Premonition, a game that at first glance is off-putting. It's weird, its appearance hasn't aged well at all, and I can guarantee that if you know nothing about Deadly Premonition, your first impression is probably, why would I play that? Or what's the catch? Which is why I'm here to tell you why I love this game so much. Why I love Deadly Premonition. But where do I begin? As soon as I began my first ever playthrough of Deadly Premonition, my jaw was on the floor. Before you are allowed into Director Swery's world, you are introduced to the madness that awaits you with this cinematic intro. It's not the prettiest looking, but the music, the tone of this intro immediately gets you intrigued. The two boys run ahead of their adult supervisor and stumble upon a pale-skinned woman on a tree in the style of crucifixion. The haunting but beautiful music kicks in and plays throughout as we get a tour of the horror in front of us. For a lot of games, first impressions can be everything. Deadly Premonition's introduction is one of the best I've had the pleasure in witnessing in a long time. After the introduction comes yet another intro, this time greeting you to Agent Francis York Morgan, the main protagonist. York is on his way to Greenvale to investigate the murder of Anna Graham, that woman shown in the beginning. With the help of the local police force, Emily, George, and Thomas, you begin your adventure to hunt down the raincoat killer. The story in of itself is pretty simple, and also heavily, heavily inspired by Twin Peaks. From York himself to the town of Greenvale to the murder of Anna Graham, the only real difference is that Deadly Premonition embraces a much more supernatural, paranormal outlook on things. But make no mistake, me saying it's heavily inspired doesn't mean that it's copying Twin Peaks word for word. Deadly Premonition does a fantastic job of forming its own identity while providing a huge nod to Twin Peaks. Federal Agent Francis York Morgan is my favorite. York is so incredibly likable, and his character oozes with this unique personality that I can't wait to hear what comes out of his mouth next. Huh. This is a good biscuit. I've never tasted a biscuit this delicious. Where in town can I get these? Well, actually... I... well... I... I baked them myself. Mm, that's amazing. What are you doing in law enforcement? He's direct, he sticks to the job, for the most part. He doesn't sugarcoat anything, it is so out of this world, it's amazing. Agent York is an incredibly well-written protagonist and will remain one of my favorites for years to come, if not forever. Throughout Deadly Premonition, York will refer to his friend, Zack. You don't see or hear him, but York will have full-blown conversations with him constantly, asking Zack his opinions on the case at hand, or asking him if he remembers when they saw Jaws in theaters years back. Jaws. 
the underwater camera work accompanied by that John Williams music. I'd never been that scared by a movie before. But the best thing about it is that it isn't just another panic movie. The mayor who won't close the beach even when there are so many victims. And Chief Brody putting the citizens' lives above all else. The film gave a lot of time to the dispute and friction between them. Zack never speaks back during these interactions, but given the deep detail York provides during these conversations, it almost feels like the two people are talking to each other. You almost get the feeling that York is actually talking to you, which is hard to not interpret as after every major case progression, York will ask if he remembers certain details that they discovered. When asked, it's you who has to pick the right answers that pertain to York's questions. This is fourth wall breaking done the right way. York interacts with various other characters along the way. He primarily collaborates with the local Greenville Police Department. George, the local sheriff, Emily, one of the deputies, and someone York is clearly infatuated with, and then Thomas, the other deputy. George and Emily constantly question York's method of investigation, but nonetheless let him continue. And Thomas is just kind of along the ride as the introvert of the group. Besides that trio, York interviews a ton of people relating to the murder, and for some reason the town of Greenville definitely hosts the most unique set of characters in such a small town. People like Roaming Sigourney and her pot that she carries around for some reason, General Lysander, a man who calls himself a general, but he's wearing a sergeant's uniform, Brian the Insomniac, or Wesley the Gunsmith, who just casually sells you weapons in the middle of town hall. Actually, a funny note, Wesley owns the Panda Bear Gun Store, a place that literally was closed every time I tried to go into it. But during missions, you get little safe rooms periodically throughout. Sometimes more than one, but always at least one safe room for each mission. Anyways, here you can stock up on ammo, buy new weapons, shave, change suits, etc. We'll come back to all that later. The way you get weapons and ammo is through an option called Panda. It literally just says Panda. So I had no clue what would happen if I initially clicked on the option for a while, so I left it alone. The game is that ridiculous that, I don't know, maybe a panda would come and tear me to shreds. Nothing like that happens thankfully, but I mean, come on, this game is nuts. Who would pay that much for a cup of coffee? I don't care that it comes with milk, no coffee should be that expensive. Lollipops, black coffee, crackers, what kind of inflation is this? There's even a thing you can do when you pass time. Missions are placed within certain time slots and if you miss the time you're told to arrive, you just have to come back tomorrow and try again. Or you can smoke a cigarette and watch the clock violently spin. It sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? Sometimes when you use this feature you'll end up in the other world, or the red world, or the bad world. I don't know. No one ever says the name of the world, but yeah, Otherworld. The Otherworld is simply put, the Silent Hill version of Greenvale. The sky turns an eerie red color from its normal gray overcast. I guess in terms of mood, it stays about the same. Zombie-like creatures come out of the ground from these black puddles, as well as the walls, and then this absolutely annoying higher threat enemy comes out from specifically vents. She remains invisible for most of the encounter, so you have to wait for her to reappear to deal some damage. At first, she had her little cool intro and it was fine. Still a terrible fight, but I figured it would maybe happen like once more or something like that. But no, that was just the introduction to a brand new enemy, 12 or so hours in. There's even an awesome sequence where you get to fight her several times one after another. God, I love it so much. Nothing brings me more joy than to see her crab walk from a vent. Nothing. I like the idea of a little supernatural exploration in Deadly Premonition, but if I'm gonna be honest, I really hated these parts of the game. Whenever the loading screen turned red to indicate that these parts were about to start, I kinda just sighed. They weren't really fun to me at all. I wanted more interaction with the characters, I wanted more vanilla Greenvale, I wanted more York dialogue, not York combat. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of all of that, but when you go to the other world, you kinda just wish you had a little bit more. Those safe rooms I mentioned earlier, where you can shave, you can change your suits, and you can even save, they live within the other world. They exist as a quick break in between the chaos that is Deadly Premonition's gameplay. Whenever I talk about my likes or dislikes with a game, I generally try to factor in everything. I want to give a consensus of the whole, not just some parts. I feel as if it's important when explaining whatever title I'm talking about. But in the case of Deadly Premonition, I can't. It's no secret that Japanese game development has been an afterthought for years. 
That may not necessarily be the case today, as with such titles like Monster Hunter World and Devil May Cry 5 being top tier in almost all fields, but Deadly Premonition is not a new game. It's been out for quite some time now. In fact, it only recently released on the Nintendo Switch, which is where I decided to pick it up a year later after that release. After pouring over 20 hours into the game, I can tell you the gameplay is really bad. Shooting mechanics feel stiff and almost unresponsive. The driving in Deadly Premonition is borderline unbearable. A slight pull of the stick and you'll go flying to whatever direction, almost as Greenville coats the roads in slick oil. Although you can turn your blinkers on and even your wipers when it's raining, so that's kind of cool. Now, do the wipers work in the rain? Not at all, but still, it's a cool feature. There are also sequences where you have to dodge the raincoat killer himself. These can vary from twitch shooter reaction quick time events to rapidly flicking the left stick left and right to run away from the killer. During these events, the game gives you not only the frontal view of York running away, but the raincoat's perspective as well, for some reason. It's identical to the game's Siren Blood Curse, where you have to hide from the enemy but can see their point of view to kind of gauge if they're inside your vicinity or not. That's a pretty useful and unique tool to have when hiding from the enemy. Here, it's pointless. As long as I just rapidly move my left joystick left and right, I'll be doing what I'm supposed to, which is getting away from the raincoat killer. But regardless, you can see what the killer is doing, which, by the way, he's just walking towards you and periodically throwing his axe at you, or maybe doing a brisk jog to catch up to you after the killer realizes that they're eating York's dust in the chase. I hated these events, not only because they were bad, but because of the fear of rapidly clicking my left stick left and right so fast would eventually cause Joy-Con drift. Not a problem on Deadly Premonition's part, but it all just kind of falls together. I will say it did make me more anxious though, so well done there, I guess. So yeah, hated the other world, hated the combat, hated the driving, the gameplay as a whole. I'm even willing to disregard the atrocious frame rate due to me playing on the Switch. I know that's not an excuse, but I understand that the game didn't have exactly the highest budget, I know it's an old game, and the best version is on the Xbox 360. Plus, honestly, it didn't even bother me that much. The FPS really only began to drop whenever I was driving, to be honest. Sometimes just being outside in general was enough, but basically just driving would really do it in. Interiors ran very well at a stable rate of 60 frames per second, so it wasn't all bad. I cannot give the same pass to the gameplay, like I said. With such low quality gameplay, can the story or charm of the game really be that good? Yes. Yes it can, and yes it is. To boil it all down, York carries this game the entire time on his back. His personality as the protagonist is so damn good. There is truly no other MC like Francis York Morgan. York is not a social butterfly at all. In fact, he's extremely awkward in how he chooses to converse with people. But yet at the same time, he bounces off the other characters he talks to without missing a beat. York's train of thought is so outlandish and practically insane that you're dying to hear his input on every single thing. Despite being an FBI agent who can't read the room to save his life, he's damn good at what he does sniffs out clues and follows trails that seem to never have a dead end for him. Watching York perform is just watching a master at his craft. The story, being the murder of Anna Graham, is simple like I said before, but the crazy turns it takes throughout your 20 hour playthrough is well, crazy. Crazy but interesting. You will find yourself wanting to figure out what happens next at every turn, and again, don't worry, I won't spoil anything regarding the main plotline. Normally, I would just give a warning that the video is going to talk about spoilers, and then I would tell you to consider yourself warned. Regarding Deadly Premonition, I don't feel as if it's right for me to spoil that for you. Sure, the game has been out for a long time now, but many people have not played it still. Maybe they've always heard about Deadly Premonition, but just never picked it up. Look, I'm telling you now, play Deadly Premonition. Yes, the gameplay is on par with Steam Greenlight quality. Yes, it's outdated looking, for sure. Yes, the sound mixing is horrible, and the open world feels empty and pointless. Uh, you know, I actually forgot. I never really talked about the open world. Well, it's because I barely invested myself into that. I had zero interest in it. There you have it. I believe you should give Deadly Premonition a shot. Now, if you were hoping for the combat and all of that to be at least entertaining, and I'm sorry, but you will not find that here. You'll most likely end up hating the game. But if you can beat around that, and yes, I use the word beat because it is quite a chore at times, to get to the meat of the game, you will absolutely have yourself an incredible time. Oh.